What does it mean to be humbled? Perhaps it's to lose some pride, to feel less important, even a little defeated. From the Latin humus, soil, to be brought down to earth, to bite the dust, to be laid low. In that sense, maybe a humbling can never actually be welcomed in as great. We would never wish for this encounter with mortality on a planetary scale, but here we are. If this is a humbling, then maybe it's about a regrounding, a reconnection, in which we are being made to stare into the dark mirror and reflect on the reflection we see staring back at us. Perhaps there's a message in that image. My name's Ed Gillespie, and myself and my co-host Dougal Hine have spent the last 20 years trying to decipher and articulate that message. How will they look in hindsight, these strange times we are living through? Is this a midlife crisis on humanity's road to the Star Trek future, or the point at which that story of the future unravelled and we came to see how much it had left out? What if our current crises are neither an obstacle to be overcome, nor the end of the world, but a necessary humbling? In the early weeks of the coronavirus crisis and the extraordinary rupture of the everyday that it represents, we set out to explore what it means to be humbled. So here we are, Dougald, uh, week five on our wanderings uh, through the kind of strange and labyrinthine times uh, in which we find ourselves. Last week, we were exploring a bestiary of metaphors, the veritable menagerie of beasts uh, uh, that we've been literally, I was going to say walking with, but we're actually not walking with them. We're probably just observing them online and out of our windows. But the animals that are not only stalking our imaginations, but are actually walking our streets. And, you know, we've got, I saw a footage of a, a moose dancing through the streets of a Lithuanian town. We've got wild boar on the streets of Paris and Barcelona and cougars, bears, coyotes, uh, and even wolves in the cities of California. I was reading this article that was talking about how there are hares running through the parks in Florence. And this was, again, a sign of how strangely the world has changed right now. And then I was looking out of my window and there are hares running through the park here in Vesteros because it's Vesteros and that's what hares do in the parks here. And I actually thought maybe this is I, part of the explanation for why Sweden seems to be kind of sort of getting away with not having the level of lockdown that almost everywhere else in the Western world has been going through. Yeah, hairs in the park are normal for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're calling this week's episode A World Turned Upside Down. Um, and those of you who have your historical hats on may know that the origins of this go back to the 17th century, around about 1642. And there's an old English ballad, uh, which was, which was a brief description of the ridiculous fashions of these distracted times. Uh, and it was actually a ballad that was coined in protest at Parliament's attempts to make Christmas a solemn occasion, you know, a religious and solemn occasion instead of the traditionally English raucous ones. And, um, Dougal and I thought there was something lovely about this idea of a world turned upside down where actually when we were, should be potentially looking at some of the, the the jollity and the positivity and the opportunity that comes out of this rather than just the solemnity and that plays to the horror and beauty of things we've touched on before and we also wanted to make room for the sheer strangeness of some of what we're living through and some of the strangenesses that maybe aren't shared and commented on as much as the goats in the streets of Flandudno, uh, which uh, my friend Sarah described, thought, thought should be set to the music of the Moody Blues song, Nights in White Satin. Um, the, the goats of Flandudno, uh, or goats in Landudno. <laughs> um, and I quite like that because we also shared the same misremembered uh, recollection that actually Moody Blues were singing about knights as in chivalry in white satin, which probably said something about the innocence of us in the 70s. Um, uh, but anyway, Dougal, as is tradition, what have you been reading this week that's been getting you thinking? Well, Ed, I have to tell you about this essay that reached me thanks to a friend in the States, Sarah Jelena Walcott. Sarah sent me a couple of things this week, and one of them was this essay by a guy called David Fowl, who has a blog called The Economics of Enough. And the essay he's written is called 11 Things So Far. And it manages to be the most random and one of the most thoughtful things that I've read amongst all of the hundreds of thousands of words that I've read that have been written in and about this crisis. 
And maybe just in its randomness, it comes kind of close to the spirit of our conversations on the podcast. <laughs> and it, when I say random, literally, I mean, it includes him doing things where you pick a a number and then you pick so number nine, you pick the ninth book on the ninth shelf in your study and you turn to page nine and read line nine of it and see what message it has for you. And I think he's you know, he's making a point about how much we are dealing with the unknown here. And there's some you know, well-targeted anger in his essay in places. He has a real go at Charles Eisenstein and uh, just in passing at Ken Wilber and more generally at anyone who's offering kind of coherency or premature prognostication, you know, what I called the other week sort of trying to find the transcendent meaning in this crisis. He's like, you know, real things are happening to real people. And uh, there's this danger of disappearing up your own ass with the you know, beautiful theories that you extract from it. And then he goes somewhere totally unexpected with that. <laughs> he quotes Bill Bryson. <laughs> and uh, this list of things that Bill Bryson has, uh, things done by 19th century vicars in England who had economic security and a lot of time on their hands. And Bryson says, never in history have a group of people engaged in a broader range of creditable activities for which they were not in any sense actually employed. <laughs> On the list, you've got George Bailden, who compiled the world's first dictionary of Icelandic. Lawrence Stern wrote The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman. Edmund Cartwright invented the power loom. Jack Russell bred the terrier that bears his name. Octavius Pickard Cambridge became the world's leading authority on spiders. William Shepherd wrote A History of Dirty Jokes. And this list just goes on and on and on. And what David Fell says is not one of these people disappeared up their own arse in the belief that they had achieved some overprivileged insight. And why? Because at least once a week, they had to stand up in front of a group of perfectly ordinary people and talk to them in terms they understood. They were forced to stay grounded. Mm, there's something really lovely about that, isn't there? It also brings to mind that if the devil really does make work for idle hands, then perhaps it's often rather interesting work <laughs> because, because clearly they were uh, manifesting their curiosity. And I'm intrigued to know what a clergyman's history of dirty jokes looks like. But We have to dig it out. <laughs> well, there's, 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 there's more than enough eloquence and insight already in that from for one essay, frankly. Um, but there's another passage further on where David Fell talks about kind of another group of people, like aside from the sort of new age, grand transcendent meaning seekers, um, more in the kind of policy world. And I think he's like, part of what I like about the essay is he's willing to own how much he sees of himself in these different groups of people. And there's an element of self-critique and self-awareness to it. So he says, you know, there's all these people talking about all the things that they want to see different afterwards. Generally, as far as I can tell, these plenty of people, all of whom are serious and well-meaning, are asking for the same things they've always asked for. For more trees, fewer evil corporations, an economy in the shape of a circle, or a donut, or an eclair. <laughs> Proper funding for this, that, or the other, an end to homelessness and hunger and poverty. I'm seeing it being written that in order to get these, in general, laudable things, the policy options need to be oven-ready or on the table, or some other metaphor indicating that the idea has to be sitting there, just waiting for the moment when... When what? When a calm and thoughtful politician decides it would be a good idea. When a high-impact think tank puts it into a paper which is well-received by an open-minded spad. When a courageous civil servant, or a parliamentary committee, or an aspiring opposition leader indicates his or her interest... What is happening right now is way, way outside the think tanks and the media bubbles and the usual channels. What is happening now is tens and hundreds and thousands of millions of people having the most profound experience of their lives. We're in the middle of the most profound flux. Talk about afterwards if you want, but don't expect it to mean much. After what? We don't even know what the what is yet. 
Mm. I wasn't I wasn't seriously planning on turning this episode into an audiobook of David Fell's <laughs> blog, but frankly I couldn't help myself. But Ed, how about you? What have you been reading? What are you going to are you going to read something to us? Uh I just loved that David Fell piece. So I mean it immediately brings me to uh Dave Eggers, What is the What? Uh one of those wonderful sort of campaigning novels if you like based on on true stories. But um what have I been reading? Well, I mean it's interesting as you say, we don't know what the what is yet, and we're not even at 40 days yet. Uh, I think it's 38 days of lockdown here in the UK today. Um, but I've been rereading T.S. Eliot, um, as you do, and I was sent there by Thomas Pueo's piece on Medium, uh, which got a lot of um, sharing last month in the early stages of the, the virus crisis, uh, The Hammer and the Dance. Uh, and essentially, if you like, it's the... It's the description of the hammer of lockdown and this very sort of brutal, sudden change in circumstances. And then the dance being what happens after the curve has been flattened and how we either have to perpetuate aspects of lockdown and social distancing for for many weeks or months. But certainly, you know, it's not all over. Um, It really is where we have to be nimble and fleet of foot. Um, And it just, it really took me back to, to... T.S. Eliot's um, Four Quartets uh, and this idea of in the stillness there is dancing um, where he says, you know, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought for you are not yet ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. Whisper of running streams and winter lightning, the wild time unseen and the wild strawberry, the laughter in the garden, echoed ecstasy, not lost, but requiring, pointing to the agony of death and birth. I love that. I love that, that line. Wait without hope. Not just wait, but be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. To me, that's... That's a very dark mountain thought. It's, I don't think we knew at the beginning that that's what we were doing with Dark Mountain, but for me, certainly that's what it became and why it mattered to the people it has mattered to. That we need spaces, and actually, particularly those of us who are and have been involved in activism, we need spaces that are free of the pressure to the rush to action and to answers. And we need that because we need to be changed. Mm. And we can't be changed while we're rushing around attempting to act on the hopes or optimism or wishful thinking that we have at the moment. There's a surrender. You have to give up the hope you had in order to pass through the journey by which you will be changed a journey Mm. that oh involves loss and so yeah it's the letting go letting go yeah and you know in the early days with dark mountain we used to get slated by people like you ed um (laughs) giving up you know you you guys you've just given up yeah you're burnt out go and do a yoga retreat or something and come back when you ready but don't go around talking to everyone about it because you'll put them off you'll depress them Mm. it's like there's always something missing from that statement about giving up giving up Mm. on what Mm. no i think that's right and you know as a sort of reformed sustainability consultant myself uh you know i always go back to the upton sinclair quote who said uh, you know it's very hard to convince a man of something when his salary depends on him not being convinced um, but yeah, I first, no, I first heard the, the T.S. Eliot line in regard to the sustainability world by, um, a guy called David Cadman, actually in the mid noughties. Uh, and it, it really resonated with me then. And it actually is reinforced by your David Fell, um, segment because in this stillness is the dancing. 
you know, this stillness is the profound moment. We are having these deep experiences um, of our lives, which are sort of transformative. Uh, and it's a bit like the whole orchestra has gone off piste, um, leaving the conductor flailing wildly to no avail at the podium. And we don't know what band or bands might be reassembled um, from the kind of improvisation that's going on right now. Um, and I think that sort of connects me into the other thing I, I watched this week, which was uh, this movie Planet of the Humans, oh, which, yes. yes, which, I mean... Yeah, where do you begin on something like this? I mean, it has Michael Moore as exec producer, so I don't know quite what we'd expect. I mean, it's highly polemical and controversial. Um, and arguably, I think on reflection, it's, it's pretty reckless and dangerous, especially given its enthusiastic reception by Breitbart and Fox News as a way of discrediting, you know, whole swathes of environmental thinking and the environmental movement. Um, and my sense was one of slight deja vu because it was strange as an environmentalist to be on the receiving end of that sort of polemic. Um, and often we're on the other side in the classic othering, you know, backing Michael Moore as he lambasts the kind of perceptions of power. Uh, and then again, it reminded me of Channel 4's The Great Global Warming Swindle, you know, a, a decade or so ago, where again, it felt like a bit of a stitch up. And apart from, you know, the sort of the rather piss poor to be honest unevidenced and slightly conspiratorial narrative of planet of the humans there is still you know a raw kernel of uncomfortable truth which i do think um jeff gibbs ha has has focused on and uh, he said are we saving the planet or our way of life you know and i think you referenced this in one of our previous episodes you know our way of life meaning the way of life of the top billion um, and the false promise we might be making to the other six and a half billion people in the planet that they might be able to aspire to that. And the logical fallacy, actually, that more industrial civilization will save us from industrial civilization. And I mean, biomass energy in particular gets a massive kicking in the film. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty difficult film to watch. Um, and I fundamentally disagree with aspects of it, but I do think, it's a shame that there's something at the heart of it that's sort of been lost in Jeff Gibbs's own midlife crisis and the way he's perhaps been a little bit too angry and polemical in its execution. Well, I mean, I haven't seen the film, but it's been hard not to read about it this week one way and another. Maybe part of, part of what there is to be angry about with it, actually, as you say, is it does a, by the sound of it, it does a disservice to some subtler, really difficult things that are worth having a conversation about, which, you know, yeah, it does come down to this thing of sustainability ends up meaning sustaining the way of living of, you know, mm. maybe one in seven people on earth today, or, you know, the way of living that one in seven people had two months ago, let's say. I mean, you probably saw this one as well. There's, there was an article on Grist. The world is in lockdown. So where are all the carbon emissions coming from? And I found this one really sobering. I kind of knew it, but still to see it spelt out. Like the current forecast for 2020 is that we'll have a drop of 5.5% in global emissions. And that would be the biggest drop ever. But at the same time, in order to have a decent chance of meeting the one and a half degree goal set at Paris, you need seven and a half percent every year from now to 2030. And I guess like, part of what struck me thinking about those numbers was it's a clue to how distorted a picture we might be getting, you know, mm. especially... You know, those of us in lockdown, especially those of us in lockdown in relatively comfortable situations, which is very, very different, as we know, to how this is for huge numbers of, of people. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, and that also belies the, the kind of the slight nonsense of behaviour change, doesn't it? Because actually it shows that the stuff that's really discretionary actually really doesn't make that much difference. So much of it is systemic. You know, it is, we haven't changed the amount of electricity and heat we consume. We're just doing it at home rather than in the office. And even if you remove vast elements of transport, 
you're still only making small inroads into those total emissions. And I think what the other bit that I took from the Grist piece was the assertion that the clean skies we're seeing are actually a vis- visible distraction from the real pollution we can't see. So everyone's, and we touched on it in episode three, I think, where we talked about the clear skies of the of the Himalayas and the visibility of northern Indian cities. Uh, but it's the real pollution we can't see that's still there, actually, and still going out in, in huge amounts. And um, I was I like the leaky bath metaphor of, of carbon emissions, you know, where the atmosphere is kind of like the bathtub um, and there's some some amount of draining out of the plug hole um, as it's reabsorbed. But we've basically still got the taps on and we need to turn the taps off, not down. Uh, and more problematically, I think 2020 is already shaping up to be the hottest year on record. Uh, and perversely, the less smog and smoke we have in the atmosphere you know the the more solar radiation we get in so it may even make it hotter so i agree that gris piece was pretty sobering reading that even in this massive shutdown the difference it's making to global emissions is actually quite marginal um and on the flip side of that i've also been reflecting on on sort of lockdown Stockholm syndrome. Kind of an ironic name, given that we're actually not locked down over here. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, exactly. But, you know, that, that sense in the Stockholm syndrome way of what irrational impulses might arise from living lockdown life a little too enthusiastically, um, especially this, what John Harris in The Guardian called the middle class Sunday supplement version. Um, and, and, and actually Jonathan Jones, the art critic also said, positivity is the opposite of sensitivity in this regard, where people are just, you know, living this sort of smug, smug life in their garden, um, having all this fantastic food delivered and, you know, homeschooling their children in some, um, idyllic bliss. Um, but in some ways the virus is our captor. Um, you know, we've sort of formed an odd style Stockholm syndrome relationship with it. Um, uh, and we are involuntarily welcoming in this past down simplicity to our lives. And I, I just, I've been reflecting on that as a sort of trauma response. And the longer it goes on, the more uncertain and perhaps the more unlikely what emerges beyond this strange bubble might be when we are, we are released by our captor. Well, I suppose part of the spirit of the conversations we've been having over the last few weeks is this hesitation that I was voicing at the beginning of the first episode. And part of where that hesitation comes from is that there are too many overlapping truths here for any single strong story about what's going on to hold. I mean, actually, I always think that the old philosophical, theological problem of evil is a bit like that. It's not, you know, if God exists, then how can the there'd be so much evil in the world it's how can a world with so much evil in it have room for so much good how can a world with so much good in it have room for so much evil that actually the numbers don't add up there is an excess of reality and that you know, that applies in this context so all of these different seemingly contradictory things that we can say have strong truth in them and actually something that i liked this week was just seeing the various versions of this meme going around where people are drawing this kind of venn diagram of all of the different positions that might seem contradictory that one can hold at the same time about the Mm. nature of this moment and this crisis there was a good piece yesterday in the guardian by dr farah jaral speaking as a medical professional about you know, people whose mental health really is benefiting from the lockdown. You know, there is this real sense of things having slowed down and of a kind of a return of sanity, not in the medical, but just in the everyday sense of the, the term, to a, a lot of people's lives, you know, with the set of conditions that we put around that, because there is the other reality, which is this harrowing thread from Yasha Ali, an American journalist who writes for New York magazine about just the anger that he's feeling at the scale of the hunger that is going Mm. on for ordinary people in the US right now. Tens of thousands of people have been contacting Yasha with their stories. And these are people who are down to eating one meal a day in order to feed their children. And people who held ordinary jobs until a month or two ago, whose lives have just been pulled out from under them. So Mm. we have to 
you know, make room for that reality and make mm. room for the reality that the you know, within the lockdown bubble, for those who are in positions of relative security, I suppose it's a bit like those Victorian vicars, isn't it? You know, we can't deny the privilege that they had compared to you know, the vast majority of people in their society. Mm. And in not denying that, we don't cancel out the thing that Bryson is talking about, about this extraordinary flourishing of you know, generous creative activity that was somehow grounded in a way that we might think the kind of you know, new age prophets of our age aren't grounded because they don't mm. have a parish to serve. Yeah. They don't have to deal with the lives and deaths and marriages of ordinary everyday people outside of their following. So I was thinking about this idea of the lockdown bubble, though, and that there's another sense in which, you know, especially for those of us whose lives look a bit like that, this is all taking place in a simulation. Mm. You know, we talked about E.M. Forster, the machine stops. And yeah, there's an element of the machine stops to this. There's also an element for a whole bunch of us of you know, this is the full on version of living in Forster's machine. You know, mm. where you never leave your flat and things come in and out and are delivered to you through screens or through people you don't even meet who bring stuff to your door. And you know, that may all just be a total detachment from consequences mm. where the actual consequences of the virus and the lockdown and everything else aren't this bubble moment that we're living mm. at the moment but the disruption of food and supply chains that could still be in the pipeline and it made me think of this amazing essay a few years ago that eon published by venkatesh rao he's one of those kind of incredibly literate engineering thinkers whose minds work so differently to mine but who write so beautifully mm. that they show you what it's like to have a mind like that and the essay is called america's artificial heartland and he he sort of tells this story of the homespun Whole Foods shop where the urban middle class go to experience their simulation of living in a kind of mm. Jeffersonian America of small farms and craft mm. and so on. And then if you were to peel the stuff away, what you've got is the concrete shell of the actual building. And then you follow the pipes and you follow the supply chains. And what you have is a kind of un industrial reality underlying the simulation of the human scale and the homespun. Mm. And that reality has become so brutal and so disassembling of anything that looks like life to us that it's kind of almost painful to know the reality behind the simulation so that's just you know that's been in my mind this week that's funny you just reminded me of something i saw jonathan jones again this morning so queuing up you know uh amongst the other members of his estate uh in central london to the local waitrose to get their final um fix of quinoa before the apocalypse um uh you know and he said it was like something out of a jg ballard novel you know ballard would have had an absolute field day oh, um, yes. with this type of imagery um but the, and i think you're right i think you know it comes back to what we were saying in episode one about the pulling back of the veil you know that americans artificial heartland thing is about this this uncomfortable revelation right so the the, the bit that i want to say is that maybe one of the possibilities we should consider is that for those who are enjoying the pleasures of the lockdown bubble right now that isn't entirely a pulling aside of the veil no. that's actually a kind of veil that we're sort of swaddling ourselves in yeah. before the reality of this hits. It's a comfort blanket. It's a, it's, you know, it's the opposite of a veil. And, and, and that, that actually was where I think I was going with, uh, another friend, Tony Spencer, um, posted a thing about Manfred Max Neef, the Chilean economist, uh, who pioneered, you know, human scale development and barefoot economics. And so I've been doing a little bit of reading about his ideas this week because, in that sense, that's that dealing with reality as it actually exists. Um, you know, he, he came up with three very basic principles, which is obviously about development is about people, not things, uh, and particularly not about GDP and other economic measures. And interestingly, he argued that needs are actually finite, you know, and satiable. Um, and yet we're told 
you know, by the economy at the moment that no human needs are incredibly diverse, you know, infinite and always insatiable. And also he argued that they're also universal, which I thought was, you know, a really quite interesting foundation from which to begin. And one of them, which comes back to this world turned upside down and the importance of being idle and the stillness piece that is running through this discussion is this this notion of idleness about being curious you know, imaginative reckless sensual humorous tranquil and receptive to new ideas uh, and it's about and he divides it up into these four themes so there's the being bit then there's the having which is the games, the spectacles, a bit like we were saying right at the start, the raucous uh, pre-Christian English traditions of Christmas, uh, the clubs, the parties, um, but also the ability to have peace of mind, playing to your mental health point earlier. There's the doing, which is the daydreaming, the brooding, the the dreaming and the re- recollection of old times, perhaps a bit of sentimentality, but also the ability to give way to fantasies and remember and relax to have fun and to play. And then there's the interacting, which is, again, fascinating in this lockdown, which is about primis- privacy and intimacy and spaces of closeness, but also uh, this idea of free time and the ability to enjoy our surroundings and landscapes. And when I was reading uh, Max Neef's stuff i just kept coming back to this really interesting intersection between maslow's hierarchy of needs uh you know max neef's work around this human scale development and then what you were saying about illich and this idea of conviviality and thinking ah well this is not a difficult triangulation to think of a very radically different way that we could be doing and organizing things Mm, so oh illich is a really hardcore thinker to deal with in some ways because he has this tendency to sort of cut through the language that other people are finding helpful and show the way in which it is reproducing the problem that you think you're escaping from and so i one of the one of the threads that i followed from illich's work has been into uh what's sometimes called critical development studies, basically um, scholars from the global south who have taken apart this whole idea of development. Gustavo Esteva, who was a close friend and collaborator of Illich and who I've um, had the chance to spend time with over the years, he would say, well, yeah, there have been all these attempts to sort of rebrand development and make it nicer over the years, but actually there is something intrinsic in the concept of development that you oh, you can't get around, that actually we have to walk away from the trajectory, the idea of a single common unifying singularity, a trajectory of human history that is at the core of the idea of development rather than just uh, make it nicer. Mm. Um, but this thing about needs and the limitedness of needs and the relationship of this to conviviality, that got me thinking of Dr. David Fleming and his book, mm. Lean Logic, mm. that was um, <clears throat> published a few years back. We, we ran some extracts from it in Dark Mountain and then it was picked up by Chelsea Green and they did a brilliant job of taking it to a wider audience And one of the amazing passages in there is where Fleming sort of turns this thing that we've all heard and we've all said over the years about needs and desires or needs and wants. Um, He sort of turns it upside down. So like the classic version of it is Gandhi. The world has enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. And Mm. like, who didn't have that poster on their wall when they were a student in third world first or whatever. But what Fleming says is, actually, this is kind of the wrong way around. Our desires are quite Mm. humble. Mm. They're actually for lots of the things that you had there on that list that came from Neef. But most of what we're doing that is fucking up the world is the result of socially constructed needs. Mm. So yeah, the the car advert might show you this seductive vision of the car being driven on this winding road in Switzerland or Norway somewhere. 
but almost all of the miles that are driven are driven mm-hmm. out of the necessity of getting to work, of getting the kids to school. They're driven being stuck in traffic. They have nothing to do with that seductive desire Mm. version of what the automobile Mm. is about. They have everything to do with the way that we rebuilt our societies and our cities into uh, a lifestyle of car dependency that in many places is almost impossible to escape from, or at least it has a real cost and there is a real privilege involved in being able to escape from it. So I really like that from Fleming. And I think he's kind of drawing on Illich there, Mm. that sense of, well, no, actually, what we need to do is uh, escape from the systems that are producing those huge amounts of emissions that are being produced, even Mm. when it looks like the machine has stopped, um, and find ways out of the trap of the needs that we've constructed. Mm. Illich in the 80s was talking about this project of writing a history of needs. Like, Uh. where did the things we think we need come from? And how did they move from us thinking we needed them to us making a world in which that need becomes a, a very heavy part of the grounded reality whatever beautiful story you might tell about the world that our hearts know is possible i remember meeting david fleming several times and he would always try and tell that like the whole story in in 20 minutes and it was wonderful to see him try and you know share this incredibly insightful you know um hugely experienced and and wonderfully evidenced actually uh world view but you know he'd stand up on stage and and try and do it in 20 minutes and there was inevitably there was always the the event organizer's shepherd's crook trying to sort of drag david off and saying david you really must wrap it up now but you could you could feel the energy it's like no no I know how to fix this. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and what I love about it is I know how to fix this, but the fix involves going through the catastrophe, not pretending that yeah. it can't that it can be headed off and that we can get to keep things as they are. I mean, that's yeah. part of what's clear in lean logic. And it's part of, you know, part of what I get from Illich and the people who he did his thinking with and also from the kind of the practical activism that comes out of that world the work of people like Mm. Gustavo Esteva or John McKnight it has that quality to it and there's been various things circulating kind of quietly amongst the the community of Illich's friends and collaborators that have come my way over recent weeks and sooner or later we're going to have to do an episode where we talk about Illich's work on medicine in the 70s and afterwards and the perspectives that that might open on this moment, on the pandemic that we're in the middle of. But there's just one bit from a piece by Sajay Samuel, who is originally from Kerala, settled in the United States, teaches at Penn State. He was one of Illich's closest students in the last years of his life. And there's one moment in this dense and complex essay that Sajay sent around where he points out to one of these kind of characteristics of the way that things are very upside down right now. And he says, look, this line has been drawn. The workforce has been divided into two categories. We have the essential workers and the non-essential workers. And the essential workers are the ones who are expected to put themselves in the firing line while we do everything to protect the non-essential workers from getting this virus. Mm. Like the non-essential workers are the people who do jobs that it turns out no one misses. <laughs> and he's just pointing to the weirdness of this, which mm. I don't think is necessarily noticed enough yet, and that may begin to play out in the politics of this in the the weeks and months ahead. The things that are revealed about the nature of work in our society We've got this. We've got this push, haven't we, to get Brits um, picking vegetables here? So you know, the, the, trying to get the the nation's food crops in. So we're flying in emergency Romanian agricultural labourers because we can't uh, recruit or keep enough people locally, and that's probably because um, the pay and conditions are not attractive enough um, to people lo- locally. And also, you know, you have a, a, a frontline NHS which is forty percent 
international staff. So we want to curb the very thing we fundamentally rely on. I think that's, as you say, playing into this kind of interesting political question and, and the, you know, curb the thing we've perhaps always relied on throughout history, which is migration. And it turns out, as you say, that the real, the really bullshit jobs are in advertising, not amongst the precariat. And it's those key workers that should now be properly valued. Bill Hicks was right all along, wasn't he? He was. He he was. In advertising. (laughs) Now, I tell you something even more interesting. In Sweden, I I haven't got right down to the source with this, but it was told to me by somebody who tends to be well informed. The farmers don't want the unemployed Swedes. So even though Sweden is less hit by lockdown and so on than most countries, it's still having a lot of things have changed here. There's a big impact on the economy. A lot of people have been thrown out of work very quickly. The farmers do not want the unemployed Swedes to come and pick their vegetables. They're insisting on the need for migrant workers from elsewhere. And when we say elsewhere, we mean poorer countries. So I, my read on that is it turns out these highly educated workers from parts of the knowledge economy and the service economy who have found themselves at the wrong end of the class of the non-essential workers, the farmers say we can't rely on them. They don't know how to work. <laughs> And again, it's upside down, like something is revealed about the gap between the story of skills and value and like who brings most to the economy and who should be paid most. And the reality underlying that simulation. Hmm. So I do have one hopeful story that came my way this week. And this comes from India. And this is a guy called Ram Subramanian from Tamil Nadu. And he was on the Remembering and Reenchanting podcast with Sarah Jelena Walcott, actually, who also sent me the, the link to the David Fell essay. So like special points to Sarah this week. Uh, Ram is talking about the reactivation of the local economy in rural India. And this is something like he's worked with local economy for years and years and years. Mm. You know, I'm sure like he would be... Uh, fluent in many of the same things that David Fleming was thinking and talking and writing about. And he says, things are happening right now that were unimaginable until a few weeks ago, where uh, local farmers, local markets, food production at the smaller scale in terms of short chains of supply, reorganisation in which you have local governments collaborating with civil society to feed people is going on in a way that is weirdly quite uh, inspiring and hopeful, despite the context, which is a mess in which it's happening. And what struck me listening to him talk about this and tell the story of the Indian rural economy and the journey that it's been on over the centuries through colonialism and out the far side and through globalization, and then this strange turn right now, is this is another of the paradoxes, another of the ways in which things are kind of upside down. Because uh, in your country or mine, uh, in the UK or in Sweden, we're in a much deeper fix. Like It's a lot longer since we had a functioning local economy Hmm. than it is in rural India. And by the way, 70% of the population of India is rural. So this is you know, a big part of the story of um, India and where it is and how it is. Mm. And uh, again, so we have, like, this is part of what someone like Gustavo would say is wrong with the maps of development that we have, because they basically like measure all of our societies and economies, like measuring children's height against a wall and say, you know, those of us here in the developed world are where you guys will be in another 30 or 50 years time, or maybe even 10 years, if you really pull your socks up. And that's been the sort of rhetoric of development that was born in the 1940s and has shaped the frame in which we thought and talked about the world ever since. And there's been much more scepticism about that from the countries that get labelled as the kind of the backward children, the ones who you know have some catching up to do, than there is within our countries. And it's not that you need to turn it upside down and put uh, the countries that have been on the hard end of centuries of colonialism, apart from anything else, at the you know, on a pedestal. 
it's that we're dealing with things that are incommensurable and mm-hmm. too much disappears from view when we start by assuming that the countries that have the biggest economies are the ones that are best placed for the future or the people who have the best paid mm-hmm. jobs or who spent the most years sitting on benches in schools and universities are the ones who know most about the world and how it mm-hmm. works and are best equipped to handle the future. And maybe this is part of what's being revealed. This is part of the the topsy-turviness of what it's like to be living in a moment like this. And e- echoing that, I also had my first two serious conversations with the uh, senior business people this week in regard to what we might call steady state businesses that might still be perceived to be successful, even if they end up dramatically smaller in terms of the, the scale than they were pre-crisis, uh, but also with no plans to grow afterwards. And I think that's beginning to challenge a really, really deep narrative um, and flip it on its head. You know, it's an inversion of a really intense orthodoxy, actually. So I'm really curious to see how that story emerges as these as these businesses grapple with the reality uh, that's emerging. And also, um, just bringing things to a conclusion, I guess, I'm I'm reflecting on the stark geopolitical contrast between some of the hints we get from Jacinda Ardern's kind and compassionate politics in New Zealand, you know, where actually her sort of surprise election victory seems to have consolidated some of her power through a, a practice of kindness uh, and compassion in politics versus some of the strong arm, you know, slightly reckless populism of, of, of Boris in particular Trump. And that goes beyond gender. And it reminds me, as always, of another of um, the wonderful Martin Shaw's powerful mythical lines, Ari, you know, in regard to despots who, in order to seize power, take out their hearts and bury them. Um, and the resolution in the mythical tales always comes from the recovery uh, of the buried heart. And you wrote a beautiful piece, The Strange Tale of Boris Johnson's Heart, last year. And I was just wondering if a near-death experience, having him suffer and ending up in an intensive care unit with COVID-19 um, and being tended by international nurses uh, and a medical team and the new fatherhood uh, with his new arrival, admittedly for the umpteenth and uncertain actual number of times that he's become a father, but whether that might actually turn Boris's world upside down. Uh, and I suspect we have to, as always, not live in unconditional, but in grounded hope. Yes, I uh, I fear that I, I won't be pinning too much hope on that particular possibility. But, you know, just there are clues in these kind of comparisons and conversations and this language and gestures towards what another kind of leadership might look like, though you know, there's a lot of work and struggle to realise those those hints and clues and gestures. So I want to just finish up with a little plug because some people listening to this might know my partner Anna and I started a school called Home a couple of years ago. And we've been very slowly sort of bringing this into the world with different projects and collaborations. But we're in the next few days, we're going to be launching our first online offering where for eight Thursdays, starting on the 14th of May, I'm going to be hosting something we're calling Homeward Bound. It's kind of a journey into the heart of the work that I've been doing over the last 20 years, where that came from, how it fits together, the people who helped me find my bearings when I was in my 20s, the thinking that underpinned the projects that I created in my 30s and where all of that is taking me now. So if you'd like to join us live and be part of that conversation, then check out a school called home.org and we'll be putting up the details in the next day or two on the site there. And I'd love to, to meet you on those calls. As a father of a three-year-old daughter, I think I will definitely be signing up. <laughs> well, Ed, thank you for another week of really fascinating conversations and look forward to seeing where we find ourselves in a week's time thank you for listening to the great humbling these are astonishing times to be living in times in which many things are revealed uncovered brought into a new light we see this podcast as very much an exploration not a prescription 
provisional investigation that maybe loves questions more than answers to begin with and needs a little time and space to breathe. This is an unscripted conversation, a wandering, if you will. And as Tolkien said, not all those who wander are lost. We plan this as a series of informal and roving conversations as we all adventure into uncharted internal and external territories. For us, daring to dream beyond the current urgency does not dismiss or disrespect it. Rather, it honours it. Whether we like it or not, our futures are already being decided today. Please do comment, ask questions and respond. You can find us on Facebook at The Great Humbling. This is initiation at a cultural scale. Please come and join us on this emergent journey.